The Grey King by Susan Cooper. Coo the Sleepers, The Grey King. Will went slowly across the slope toward Bran. It was a gray day now. The rain had fallen all night, and there was more to come. The sky was lowering, ominous, and all the mountains were lost in ragged cloud. Will thought, the breath of Brennan Lude. He saw Bran climbing away up the hill, diagonally, in an obvious effort to avoid him. Will paused and decided to give up. A ridiculous game of dodging across the mountain would do no one any good. And besides, the harp had to be taken to a safe place. He set off through the wet bracken on the long, muddy walk to the far side of Caradog Pritchard's farm. His trousers were already soaked. In spite of Wellington boots borrowed from Aunt Jen, partway he crossed the land that had been swept by the fire, and a thin mud of black ash clung to his boots. Will strode along moodily. He glanced round now and then, in case Caradog Pritchard was about, but the fields were deserted and oddly silent. No birds sang today. Even the sheep seemed quiet, and there was seldom the sound of a car drifting from the valley road. It was as if all the gray valley waited for something. Will tried to sense the mood of the place more, ac more accurately, but all the time now his mind was gradually filling again with the enmity of the gray king, growing, growing, a whisper groan to a call, soon to grow to a furious shout. It was difficult to find attention for much else. He came to the slate-roofed shelter where he had hidden the harp among the stacked bales of hay. The force of his own spell brought him up standing ten feet away, as though he had walked into a glass wall. Will smiled. Then to break the enchantment in the way appointed, he began very softly to sing. It was a spell song of the old speech, and its words were not like the words of human speech, but more indefinite, a matter of nuance and sound. He was a good singer, well taught, and the high, clear notes flowed softly through the gloomy air like rays of light. Will felt the force of the resisting spell melt away. He came to the end of the verse. Caradog Pritchard's voice said coldly behind him, Proper little nightingale, isn't it? Will froze. He turned slowly and stood in silence, looking at Pritchard's pasty, full-cheeked face with its crooked nose and eyes bright as black currants. Well, said Pritchard impatiently, what do you think you are doing here, standing in the middle of my field, singing to the hedge? Are you mad, boy? Will gaped, changing his face, a, changing his face subtly to an expression of total foolishness. It was the song. I just thought of it. I wanted to try it out. They say you're a poet, you know. You ought to understand. He let his voice drop conspiratorially. I write songs sometimes, you see, but please don't tell anyone. They always laugh. They think it's stupid. Pritchard said, Your uncle? Everyone at home. Pritchard squinted at him suspiciously. The proud word poet had made its effect, but he was not the kind of man to relax unwarily or for long. He said contemptuously, Oh, the English, they know nothing of music. I'm not surprised. Claude's they are. You have a very good voice for an English boy. Then he sharpened suddenly. But you weren't singing English, were you? No, Will said. What then? Will beamed at him confidently. Nothing, really. They were just nonsense words that seemed to go with the tune. You know. But the fish did not bite. Pritchard's eyes narrowed. He looked in a quick, nervous movement up the valley toward the mountains and back at Will. He said... I don't like you, English boy. Something funny about you, there is. And all this about songs and singing does not explain why you are standing here on my land. Taking a shortcut, that's all, Will said. I wasn't hurting anything, honestly. Shortcut, is it? From where to where? Your uncle's land is all over there, where you came from, and nothing is on the other side of us except moor and mountain. Nothing for you. Go back to Clue, Nightingale. Back to your snivelling little friend who lost his dog. Off! Off out of here! All at once he was shouting, the pudgy face, dusky red, Get out! Get out! Will sighed. There was only one thing to be done. He had not wanted to risk attracting clo the closer attention of the Grey King, but it was impossible to leave the harp vulnerable to Caradog Pritchard's eye. The man was glaring at him now, clenching his fist in a fit of the same unaccountable vicious rage that Will had seen overtake him before. Get out, I tell you! Get out! There, in the open field... Under the still gray sky, Will stretched out one arm with all five fingers stiff and pointing and said in a single 
and said a single quiet word, and Caradog Pritchard was caught out of time, immobile, with his mouth half open, and his hand raised pointing, his face frozen in exactly the same ugly anger that had twisted it when he shot the dog cattle. It was a pity, Will thought bitterly, that he could not be left that way forever. But no spell lasts forever, and most for only a short breath of time. Quickly Will went forward to the stone shelter, reached in between the bales of hay, and pulled out the gleaming little gold harp. One corner of its frame was caught on an old tattered sack left among the bales, and patiently he tugged both harp and sacking free, bundled them together under his arm, then he moved round to stand behind Caradog Pritchard. Once more he pointed a stiff-fingered hand at him and spoke a single word, and Caradog Pritchard, as if he had never intended to do anything else, plodded off across the field toward his farmhouse without once turning round. When he arrived there, Will knew he would be convinced that he had gone straight home from the day's work and he would not have an ounce of memory of Will Stanton standing in the field singing to the sky. The plodding, paunchy form disappeared over the stile at the end of the field. Will untangled the old sack from the harp's intricate golden frame and was about to toss it aside when he realized how useful it would be as a covering. A nameless bundle under his arm could be explained away if he should meet someone rather more easily than a gleaming and obviously priceless golden harp. As he slid the harp carefully inside the sack, wrinkling his nose at the hay dust puffing out, a movement came across the field, caught his eye. He glanced up, and for a moment even the harp left his mind. It was the great gray fox, king of the Milguin, creature of Brynan Lud, loping fast along the hedge. In sudden furious hatred, Will flung out one pointing arm and shouted a word to stop it but the big gray animal no longer on its master's land tumbled, and the big gray animal no longer on its master's land tumbled backwards in mid-stride as if it had been snatched up by a sudden tremendous high wind. Picking itself up, it stood staring at Will, red tongue lolling. Then it lifted its long muzzle and gave one, long, one low howl like a dog in trouble. It's no good calling, said Will under his breath. You can just stand there till I decide what to do with you. But then involuntarily he shivered. The air seemed suddenly colder, and across the fields all around him he could see creeping in a low ground creeping in a low ground mist that he had not noticed before. Slowly it came pouring over the fences, relentless, like some huge creature crawling creature. From every direction it came, from the mountain, the valley, the lowest slopes, and when Will looked back at the grey fox standing stiff legged in the field, he saw something else that gave a chill of new terror to the mist. The fox was changing color. With every moment as he watched, its sleek body and bushy tail grew darker and darker until it became almost black. Will stared, frowning. He thought irrelevantly, It looks just like Pen. And instantly he caught his breath, realizing something that was not irrelevant at all, that it was John Rowland's dog Pen, who Castle had been accused by Caradog Pritchard. that it was John Rowland's dog, Penn, who, with Caffle, had been accused by Caradog Pritchard of the sheep attacks made in reality by the foxes of the Great King. Something immeasurably strong was pushing against him, breaking his own enchantment. Whilst Will stood for a moment, confused and powerless, the big fox, now black as coal, gave its strange, small, exultant leap into the air, grinned deliberately at him, and was off running swiftly across the field. It vanished through the far hedge in the direction that Caradog Pritchard had taken toward his farm. Will knew exactly what was likely to happen when it got there, and there was nothing he could do. He held back. He was held back by the power of the Great King, and reluctantly, now that he was facing an idea to which he had not given a thought before, the possibility that this power, much greater than his own, was in fact so great that he might never be able to accomplish his allotted quest. Setting his teeth, he gripped the shrouded harp beneath his arm and set off across the field toward Clued Farm. Carefully, he slipped under the barbed wire, edging the field, crossed the corner of the next, clambered over the stile leading into the lane. But all the time, his steps grew slower and slower, his breathing more labored. Somehow, there beneath his arm, the harp was growing heavier and heavier until he could scarcely move from the weight of it. He knew that it was not a matter of his own weakness. Against his resistance, some great enchantment was giving 
to the precious thing of power in his arm, a heaviness impossible for any human strength to support. Clutching at the harp, he gasped with pain at its impossible weight and sank down with it to the ground. As he crouched there, he raised his head and saw that the mist swirled everywhere around him now. All the world was gray-white, featureless. He stared into the mist, and gradually the mist took shape. The figure was so huge that at first he could not realize it was there. It stretched wider than the field, and high into the sky it had shape, but not recognizable earthly shape. Will could see its outline from the corner of his eyes, but when he looked directly at any part of it, there was nothing there. Yet there the figure loomed before him, immense and terrible, and he knew that this was a being of greater power than anything he had ever encountered in his life before. Of all the great lords of the dark, none was singly more powerful and dangerous than the great king. But because he had remained always from the beginning of time in his vastness among the Cataridris peaks, never descending to the valley or lower slopes, none of the old ones had ever encountered him to learn what force he had at his command. So now Will alone, last and least of the old ones, faced him with no defense but the inborn magic of the light and his own wits. And we will pause there.